My dear brothers and sisters, today's session titled Journey of the Soul is uh, based on Sri Aurobindo Savitri, Book 6, Canto 2, lines 783 through 810. In my edition of Savitri, it occurs on page 459, Book 6, Canto 2. It's uh, commonly accepted, although most of us have no clear-cut means of verifying it, that our ordinary view of reality is very limited. The way we view reality based on our sensory experience and past experience and logic and so on is only a part of the reality and there is at least something beyond it that is a vague perception that uh, most of us have uh, partly it is inherent, partly we have picked it up from the surroundings, from people who we know, know much more than we do. So it is somehow in our blood, it has been passed on to us uh, through the vision of the rishis, which has been recorded in the scriptures, in, like the Upanishads, and uh, that somehow has percolated down to the extent that uh, most of us have no difficulty in accepting that uh, the ordinary view of reality, which uh, uh, guides most of our life, uh, we may consider it quite adequate to guide our ordinary life, but still we know somewhere that that is not all that is. There is uh, a deeper, higher and wider picture of reality of which we are not sufficiently aware. Now the relevance of all this will become clear as we go along uh, in today's session. But let's first start with uh, something which is relatively ordinary and with which we can easily relate. We may treat the earth, this world, as a school in which uh, we are all learning something. So to treat the earth as a school is something which we have no difficulty in accepting. We all feel that uh, we have experiences in life and they teach us something. In that sense, our life in this world is uh, like being in a school, which means if I have grown so old, I've learned something just by being in this world. So there is uh, this idea of uh, treating the world as a school is not difficult for us to relate to. And where do these lessons come from in this school? They come from the experiences which we have in life. That also we don't have any difficulty in accepting. But then what is the goal of this school? Where does this education end? When do we get the PhD, the final degree, the highest degree that any university can give? In this earth university, what is that highest degree? How can we get it? When will we get it? Hmm? Now, that is where our ordinary view of reality fails. And we are told that uh, the way we look at ourselves as uh, a person with a certain name and its form and uh, a certain parentage and a certain uh, position or a certain residence and so on, all this is only a very limited reality. In fact, at the deepest level, we are all divine. We are a manifestation of the divine. We are another form of the creator itself and that uh, the purpose of life is to manifest as much of that divinity as possible. Because if we were to manifest all of divinity, then we would be doing everything right, we would be full of love and compassion, and uh, falsehood would have no place in our lives. But then the fact is that uh, all types of falsehood does enter into our ordinary life, and therefore we are not manifesting uh, the divinity which is inherent in us. We may be inherently divine, we may be potentially divine, but in actual practice, we do not behave as if we are divine and the goal of life is to manifest more and more of that divinity within and if we look at it that way then the goal of life would be or sort of the ultimate degree that we can get in this school called earth or the university called the earth the ultimate degree that we can get from it is the full manifestation of the divinity which is within us. So when we manifest the divinity fully, we become one with that divine, we behave the way the divine would expect us to, or 
when uh, that mirror which was referred to, you know, mira, Muraman Darpan Kehlai, when that has no dhul, it has dhul bilkul na jamne pae, so it has no dhul left, it is all clear, and uh, we have a clear perception of what is right and wrong. Not only with that, we also have developed the will to do what is right. Knowing what is right is one thing, doing only what is right is another. So when we actually start doing only what is right, then we are fully manifesting the divinity. That would be the goal. So now the goal or the ultimate degree that we can get from this university is fixed. But then uh, we know that uh, we cannot really achieve this in a lifetime. That also we understand. And uh, also that although the goal is fixed, the courses for each one of us are individualized. Because if the experiences of life are the courses, then each one of us has a different set of experiences, unique set of experiences. So while the ultimate uh, goal is fixed, the courses are individualized, the lessons are individualized, and uh, therefore, uh, we all have, to some extent, an independent path, although the ultimate goal is the same, the curriculum, the courses, the lessons are individualized for each one of us, and it is up to us to make use of those uh, lessons while going through life. Life itself provides us those experiences which uh, we can use for going towards the goal. Now, if uh, the goal cannot be reached in a lifetime, then uh, rebirth, that is uh, getting a second chance to continue where we left off, becomes a logical necessity. So that is the importance of being born again and again. But then if we have to be born again and again, there has to be a continuity between uh, the individual who leave this leaves this world at death and the one who returns to get more lessons so that the journey can continue. Where is that continuity? That continuity is provided by the soul. It is the soul that is soul of the individual that is immortal and that provides that continuity from life to life. Now here the question arises that if the soul is uh, a spark of the divine, the soul is our divine essence and we are only manifesting uh, the divinity and the soul is divine, then isn't it already perfect? Why does it need to come back again and again in another body? So if the continuity is only the soul, then why does it have to come back again and again? It is already perfect. Well, this you can say is a part of the game of the creator. That the soul is perfect, but uh, the manifestation, the embodied soul, or the soul which has acquired now a body and a mind, that is not perfect. And uh, at the same time, because the essence is perfect, it is capable of going towards perfection. And uh, that is why the soul, in spite of being divine, needs to come back again and again. So what is it that is really evolving? Is it the soul that is evolving? Is it the psychic being that is evolving? Now these would be entering semantics. But uh, one can say that yes, in a, with limited, sort of with some limitations and some arguments which can be easily raised against it, we can say that it is the psychic being that is evolving. It's an evolving entity. And uh, once it has grown and developed and evolved, in spite of being the dynamic aspect of the soul itself, uh, it returns in the next life, the soul along with its dynamic aspect, the psychic being, returns again and again to continue the journey further. And uh, what is the effect of coming again and again? If uh, uh, we are at least evolving to some extent in each life, the result would be that uh, with each subsequent birth, we would manifest more of the divinity, which means we would be more loving, more caring, more willing to share, more compassionate. So our nature, our surface nature will keep changing with each life. So imagine a person who has come back to, come to this world for the first time as a human being. Before that, suppose it was an animal. Then how would he behave? In fact, there was one person in the Pondicherry ashram 
who used to behave very badly. And the mother was asked that, see, this person doesn't fit into the ashram, why don't you throw him out of the ashram? And the mother said something to the effect, have patience, this is the first time he has come to this world as a human being. Which means that there is a certain type of behavior which you expect from a person who has come for the first time, and a certain other type of behavior who has come, say, after uh, spending a thousand lives already as a human being on earth. Now that is the importance of the human birth and this is one way in which we can understand the broad spectrum of behavior that we observe, the broad spectrum of human nature that we observe in the world. Now, however, within this there are two phases. The person may come for the first time as a human being and then evolve gradually but then this evolution is not a conscious evolution. The person is not uh, making a deliberate ch choice in that I have to evolve. It is happening somehow. Then begins the second phase after a certain number of lives, one can't say how many, uh, but uh, after a certain number of lives that phase begins when the person becomes more aware of the true purpose of life and starts evolving more consciously starts making a conscious effort to evolve instead of leaving it to chance and accident. So these two phases broadly speaking one can have but at the same time the essence remains that the soul has a long journey which it performs by coming back again and again to this world so that it can pick up from where it left off because uh, the way we are constituted the body is not uh, sturdy enough to last a whole lifetime, it leaves us somewhere midway and uh, fails us, it becomes too frail to support further growth. But then uh, the divine can do everything. Why did the divine design human beings like this? He could have given each human being a life of 1000 years, the way some trees have. Huh? Human beings could have also lived for 1000 years, completed the journey in one life itself. Well, if one were to rationalize it, one might say that uh, one life which is that long, under the type of conditions that prevail on the earth, but perhaps be too tiring for any of us. It would be too exhausting. He would also give us, have to give us the corresponding patience, which we can't sure whether we'll have. But uh, more important, perhaps, more rational may be the fact that uh, we also need to digest the experiences of one set of lessons. And uh, that we find even in ordinary schools. Uh, you read a lesson, but that is not enough. You need time to digest it. That is why there is some homework given. That is why there is an examination set so that you'll revise the lesson before going for the exams. That is why there's a vacation so that uh, maybe you will digest some of what you learnt uh, already. And these days, uh, it makes a lot of sense. It's becoming more and more common for students to say, I'm taking a break for a year which means I've learned something, but before I start learning more in a formal setting, I just want to take a break to digest what I already know. Another reason why perhaps uh, multiple lives are necessary are you know, that uh, each life gives us one set of experiences and uh, there is a limit to the variety of experiences which we can have in one life. So if we are to have a very different entirely different type of experiences, another life in another form, in another family, in another set of circumstances would be required. To give a simple example, the type of experiences which a king can have, a poor person cannot, and the other way around is also true, the type of experiences a poor person can have, a king cannot. Now, it may be difficult for uh, the same life to involve all types of experiences within the same life. Easier is to be born say, as a king in one life and as a poor person in another life. And that's why uh, there's no guarantee that if a person has been a very good king, then in the life, next life he'll be born even a bigger king or an emperor. There's no such guarantee. In fact, in the next life he may be born a very poor person to get another set of experiences which he could not get as a king. So. Uh, we need varied experiences. Those, these may be some of the reasons with our limited mind one can think of why the divine did not give us a life of a thousand years so that, or 
5,000 years so that we could complete the journey in one life. Now you may say if that is so, multiple lives are necessary, but at least the divine could have given us knowledge of what we have already learnt, in what forms we came earlier, knowledge of our previous lives. We know nothing about our previous lives either. And uh, the only reason we have to believe that these multiple lives are there, either because the rishis have told us, or there are some occasional freak cases where the person knows a bit about one or two previous lives. So those freak cases are there. Uh, but uh, those freak cases, I think, have been planted again by the divine to convince us of this idea of rebirth. But otherwise, that is not the normal thing. The normally, we do not remember anything of our previous lives. And one may also ask, if we remember nothing of our previous lives, then what use is all the learning that happened in the previous lives? If the earth is a school, all the learning that happened, that is also gone if we remember nothing. Now that is actually, you know, not really thinking deep enough. Because uh, how many of us remember all the history and geography that we learned, say, in class 6 or 7? Hmm? Even in this life, we don't. Uh, but then, uh, still, we are able to manage life quite well, number one. Number two, what would happen if we had the capacity to remember everything that we learned from uh, entering school right up to uh, today? If everything that we have learned were actually available to us, it will not be of much use but it will definitely create a very unmanageable, unwieldy clutter. That's all it will do. So perhaps it is good that we have forgotten much of what we learned. It doesn't clutter our minds. But then you say, if you have forgotten much of what we learned, then what is the use of having learned that at all? Again, relating even to ordinary everyday experience in this life. If uh, all that we have forgotten is of no use at all, then why should there be any difference between an educated person and an uneduca uneducated person? If the educated person who went to school and college has forgotten much of what that person learnt in school and college, this person should be exactly the same as a person who never went to school or college. Why is there a difference? Which means although much of what the person learnt has been forgotten, enough has been retained to make this person different. What is that that has been retained? The essence. It has somehow created a certain type of a change in the personality of this person, the way the person thinks and behaves, which makes this person different from the person who never went to school or college. And that is how, perhaps, that is why it said that the psychic being also brings back in the next life only the essence of the past experiences. That is what is meant. Which means that the journey that had been performed earlier in the previous lives was not a waste. What was learned was not a waste. The evolution of the psychic being was not a waste in spite of the fact that much of the previous lives is all forgotten. So forgetting that is not a handicap, it is a boon. That knowledge would only clutter our minds, confuse us and maybe create all types of complexes which, are, which will hamper, will drive us into all types of bylanes, into all types of uh, uh, side tracks which will deflect us from the main path in this life. So, it's good that we do not have knowledge of the previous lives. But what is important is the essence should be retained and it seems that essence is retained and that is what makes a person who has put in some work in a thousand lives earlier, this person behaves differently from a person who was an animal in the previous life and has come as a human being for the first time. The difference is because the person who has spent a thousand lives doing something earlier has brought the essence of those thousand lives even in this life and that is why right from the beginning he behaves differently. Even as a child, this person's tendencies are quite different. So it is the essence that is retained. Now with this background, let's see what we were actually supposed to do and that is talk about these lines from Savitri. Now the context of these lines in book 6, Canto 2 line 783 to 810 on page 459 in my edition of Savitri. The context of these is that Savitri has uh, gone on a quest to find a mate. She has found Satyavan, has come back home, that is the palace of King Ashwapati, who was her father. She has come back and told them that I have found the person whom I want to marry. But then before there could be much of a celebration, arrives Narad 
and uh, Narad, to start with, congratulates, but at the same time, he puts in those little, little hints which create some doubts in the mind of Savitri's mother, the queen. And she asks, tell me clearly what you are trying to say, what you are hinting at. After a little hesitation and vacillation, he ultimately reveals that the person he, she has chosen is a perfect mate for her, but. What is that but? But he will die after a year. He is destined to die exactly in one year. No matter how suitable the partner is, how good the partner is, this the queen cannot accept. And we as human, ordinary human, we can understand why she does not accept it. And uh, then she raises many questions. Not only that Savitri should not marry this person, she raises many questions about why there is death, why there is a certain fate which we are su supposed to accept anyway, why the divine has created this type of a world, she has a few angry words for that God who created this crazy world which we can't make any sense of. Why did he have to create it this way at all? Why did he have to bring so much pain and suffering and sorrow in this world? She raises many such fundamental questions which make a lot of sense. But at the same time, they reveal a certain degree of ignorance of the basic truths of existence. And therefore, in reply, then Narad says a lot which bring out those deeper truths of existence. And these lines reveal some of those deeper truths and the lines in which he is, which we'll be discussing today, Narath talks about the journey of the soul from life to life. That is what he talks about in these lines. Now these deeper truths of existence were known also to Ashwapati. Hmm? He also knew perhaps that Satyavan will die after a year. He was a Maharshi himself. We know that actually Ashwapati was nothing but Sri Aurobindo. He knew all that and even in Savitri, the epic that he has written, Ashwapati had performed enough of a yagya to reach the very peaks, but then he was not satisfied even with those peaks of yoga. He wanted more. He wanted the world to change and he pleaded with the Divine Mother and that's how Savitri had been sent. So he was a rishi at that level. So he also knew all this. Why doesn't he say it? Firstly, it would have been inappropriate. If the father himself says that you have chosen the right person but he will die after a year, then the queen will say that what type of a father are you? You are still telling her go and marry that person. Huh? She, her behavior would have been very different from the way that her behavior was with Narad. If Narad reveals the same thing, her behavior is different. If Ashwapati reveals the same thing, the behavior would be very different. And uh, with Narad's argument, she may still accept. And she did, finally. With Ashwapati's argument, she would not have. Huh? Ki baat sunta koi. <laughs> so she wouldn't have agreed. So that is why it was important for Narad. So that was another divine intervention. Let Narad go and do that job, that unpleasant job of revealing the future and then handling the emotions of the queen and very important in that process giving some very beautiful lessons on the deeper truths of existence which were not meant only for the queen, they were meant also in this setting perhaps for Savitri. So that she is once again is able to revise even in this human form, even as an avatar, you know avatars also need a guru. So Savitri was an avatar in the sense that she had, it was the divine itself who had sent her divine on, in human form. But the avatars also need a guru. And in a way, Narad assumes that role of the guru. Her father was also in a way, the, not only the father, but also the guru. But then Narad also assumes the role of a guru in a formal way for Savitri also. So that is why it had to be done by Narad. Now let's come to those lines, finally. Adventurer through blind, unforeseeing time, a forced advance through a long line of lives, it pushes its spearhead through the centuries. Now who is this adventurer through blind, unforeseeing time? The soul. The soul of a human individual, an individual soul. It is an adventurer. Going through uncharted territory, so it's an adventure. And what is the terrain? blind, unforeseeing time. 
Hunukri indicates the type of darkness and the blindness which is taking this adventurer, the soul, through unforeseeing time. Time is an illusion. Time has been created by the timeless. So that's why it's adventure through unforeseeing time. Time is unforeseeing. It does not see. But the timeless who has created time sees everything. And in fact, in spite of the time being unforeseeing, the eventual course is what has been seen by the timeless. So that is guiding this movement, but same time from a distance, just watching. You know, something like, you know, uh, good parents, what they do is, when the child is too small to be left alone, they accompany the child to say the ch uh, park where many children are playing, but then they don't hold the child's hand all the time. Not only they don't hold the hand, let the child go and play. Get on to the swing, get on to the seesaw, go to, get on to the slide, whatever, you know, and uh, interact with the other children. They let the child do that. They stand at a distance from where the child can't even perhaps see the parent. But they can see the child. So that is the type of situation. So the, the child is in that unseeing, unforeseeing situation doesn't realize that the parent is watching and that is how the child can develop much better. But the parent is watching. When they feel that the child is in danger, then they quickly intervene. Till then, they just sort of maintain a distance. So that is the type of unforeseeing time following the, uh, broadly speaking, the plan laid down by the timeless. Adventurer through blind, unforeseeing time, a forced advance through a long line of lives. So, it is uh, an advance which is being driven by, through a force, which the force itself is unstoppable, and this force continues to drive this adventurer, the soul, through a long line of lives, one life after another. It pushes its spearhead through the centuries, and this type of uh, movement which is being led uh, by this soul is leading, there's a leader of this movement coming again and again. Uh, it continues through the centuries. Across the dust and mire of the earthly plain, on many guarded lines and dangerous fronts, in dire assaults, in wounded slow retreats, or holding the ideal's battered fort, or fighting against odds in lonely posts, or camped in night around the bivouac's fires, awaiting the tardy trumpets of the dawn, in hunger and in plenty and in pain, through peril and through triumph and through fall, through life's green lanes and over her desert sands, up the bald moor along the sunlit ridge, in serried columns with a straggling rear, led by its nomad vanguard signal fires, marches the army of the way lost God. So, who is this adventurer? whose army is marching, the way lost God. That's another sort of, you can say, synonym, a poetic expression for the soul. It is God itself. Soul is a spark of the divine, but it is way lost. It has found its, it has lost its way. Uh, it's traveling through uncharted territory. It is apparently blind. It is just being forced through an, uh, by an unseen force, but doesn't know where it is going. So it's way lost God. And what does it go through in life after life? Through different types of conditions and circumstances. And that is what that has been described in all these lines which I read rather fast. Different types of conditions and circumstances this soul keeps getting, this way lost God keeps getting in different lives. And life after life through centuries, it gets these varied conditions. Let's have a quick look at some of the conditions that have been described in a poetic way. The dust and mire of the earthly plain. The dust as in a desert and the mire, the wet and sticky mud. Dal dal, kichad, huh? Sukha, sukhi dust, kichad, all that. On many guarded lines and dangerous fronts, kahi ladai ho rahi hai, no battle going on and so on. Somewhere some battles can be dangerous and so on. In dire assaults, in wounded slow retreats. So sometimes very uh, serious and concerted attacks and sometimes a calculated, deliberate retreat. 
or holding the ideal's battered foot. Or in some life, the individual arrives with an ideal. I stand for this ideal, I'll defend it at any cost. So holding the ideal's battered foot, but then the ideals have a tendency to get attacked by the surrounding world. Nobody likes to, you to sort of continue along with the ideal. They want you to make compromises. Be practical, be pragmatic. These ideals are no use in this world. So that's how the ideal's fort is always a battered fort. Or holding the ideal's battered fort or fighting against odds in lonely posts. Or you may be the only one holding a post of the ideal alone uh, watch man, guard, watchdog, whatever you may like to call him, all alone. So all these, these can be the various roles that the person plays in different lives. Or camped in night around the bivouac's fires. What's a bivouac? Bivouac is, you know, is a, a place where you camp in something which looks a bit like a tent, but there may be no, even, not even a roof, because the, pers uh, the campers, say like mountaineers, have to stay there for a very short time. So some sort of a shelter is there, but not even as good as a tent. They may light a fire to keep themselves warm. So life may also be comparable to that. That is, that is the type of conditions where you are there for a short time, temporary stay and so on. In some lives it would be like that. Awaiting the tardy trumpets of the dawn. Or maybe this, these bivouacs are not the bivouac of a mountaineer, but that of a soldier as the next line indicates, awaiting the tardy trumpets of the dawn. Because at night there is no war going on. At dawn, a trumpet would be blown to signal that, well, now it's time to get up and resume the war. You know, that's how the wars of Mahabharat were, no? Shankh uh, bajake shuru karte the. So uh, that is, uh, or camped in night around the bivouac fires, awaiting the tardy trumpets of the dawn. And then another set of conditions, which the soul might have got, the embodied soul got in other li life after life, in different lives, in hunger, in some it was, and in plenty, and in pain. So hunger, plenty, and pain in different lives or within the same life, that's also possible. Through peril and through triumph and through fall, some lives were dangerous. In some triumph or within the same life also similar variations can be there. And through fall, that is, like those snakes and ladders, a steep fall, that also happens. Person made some progress in many previous lives and all that is destroyed in one big fall. That can also happen. It's not a linear path. It's a zigzag path. And uh, one gets both snakes and ladders in multiple lives, also within the same life. Through peril and through triumph and through fall, through a life's green lanes, beautiful green lanes, and over her desert sands, so all types of variations are there in the type of circumstances one gets in life and in different lives. Up the bald moor. Moor is the green patch of grass, wild grass on hilltops. Hmm? Something like Panchagani, that sort of thing. Yeah? Up the bald moor along the sunlit ridge in serried columns with a, a straggling rear led by its nomad vanguard signal fires. So. Here, another comparison with another type of group marching uh, in columns, which are very close, and uh, they just go from place to place. That is the sort of uh, normal for the nomads. And uh, to see the path, signal fires. It's dark, but then you light a fire, you can see the next few feet. You light a torch. You know, it doesn't tell you too much about what may be at a long distance, but the next few feet it can tell you. So signal fires, uh, and that is all what is there to guide this, these nomads. So through all these different types of circumstances and conditions, marches the army of the way lost God. Now begins the next phase in the next few lines. Then late, the joy ineffable is felt. Finally, this way lost God, the soul, feels a joy ineffable. Ineffable, that which cannot be expressed in words. It can only be felt. 
inexpressible in speech, in words. That type of joy is felt by this way lost God, the soul. Now as you can see, now this is the transition from the unconscious yoga to the conscious yoga. So from this point on, living for the sake of spiritual growth becomes a conscious activity for this person in life. Then late, the joy ineffable is felt. Then he remembers his forgotten self. He has refound the skies from which he fell. Now he knows where I have come from, why I have come, what is the goal of life. And just realizing that, seeing a purpose to life, a purpose that takes this person to, in a direction that will make this person more and more fulfilled, more and more independent of external circumstances. The person is no longer affected by the ups and downs of life. When the person is able to see that, that that is what I'm supposed to do, that is why I'm where I'm supposed to go, that is why I'm here, because in fact I have fallen from there just for this very purpose on this planet Earth. And that is why my soul has got embodied in this form, in these circumstances. When the person realizes that, that realization, that consciousness, that awareness itself brings unspeakable joy. Then late the joy ineffable is felt, then he remembers his forgotten self. He has refound the skies from which he fell. There's a little story which can illustrate this. Uh, there was once a king in whose kingdom came a traveling troupe which used to stage plays. They staged a play. The king liked it very much. He wanted a second performance. And uh, the, naturally the drama company, the troupe was very happy to get these compliments from the king. But the king also laid one inconvenient incon condition. He said, I should also have a role in that play. Now, they knew that the king will not be able to do well. He'll spoil the play. He will not remember the lines of the dialogue. He doesn't know acting. So, but how to tell the king that we can't give you a role? So they told him, okay, we we'll, can give you a role, but somehow we don't feel like it because it doesn't befit your stature. He said, doesn't matter. A play is a play. I can play any role. He told him, sir, you have to play the role of a beggar. Will you do that? We don't feel like uh, asking you to play that role. No, no, I'll be happy to be a beggar. So they gave him the role of a beggar who was just supposed to sit in one corner on the stage and just say, bhikshado, bhikshado, bhikshado. You know, that's all he had to do. So that part, that new day he'll be able to do. So gave him that role. Now, when the play was over, he still kept sitting in that corner and kept doing bhikshado, bhikshado. Then, you know, they told him, you are, sir, you are the king. Now the play is over. Now you can go and dress up in your normal dress and go to the palace and sit on the throne. But he still went on doing that. He had forgotten where, what, who he truly was. You know. So then the uh, minister, his senior most minister, uh, who was clever and intelligent, he could understand why he's doing this and how to bring him out of it. He knew he needs a little bit of a shock. So he threw his beard off, pulled his artificial beard off, and uh, took him in front of a mirror and put that uh, part of those robes on around his shoulders and told him, look, this is what you are. Uh, then he, when he saw himself without that uh, sh uh, shabby beard and that shabby dress and instead of that royal robe, he knew, yes, I am the king. Now he knew who he was. Now, that is something, like, uh, all the previous lives, the soul was not aware of its true identity. Now it knows from where it has fallen. It has fallen the position, it had fallen to the position of a beggar from somewhere and now it knows what it truly is. So that discovery itself brings unspeakable joy. Another analogy which I sometimes like giving to understand this is that uh, suppose there is a tree and behind the tree is someone, you can say the divine, who is hiding. And uh, the tree, and he's holding a rope. Now, 
the rope is partly around the tree and then there's a very long rope which is ultimately tied to a human being. Now the rope is so long that this human being thinks that um, I can go wherever I want. The rope does not create any limitation on his movements. That is the free will of the human being. But then uh, the person who is standing behind the tree, hiding there, is doing one little thing. He is gradually pulling the rope. So the rope is very long, but it's gradually getting shorter. And eventually there comes a time when this rope has become short enough that to sort of for the person to feel when he tries to run too far away from the tree to feel a little tension. So then he feels that why is it that uh, uh, I can run wherever I want but uh, if I go too far away from this tree I feel this tension. So he feels that let me be a little closer to the tree. Then he starts running closer to the tree and he finds that the tree is in fact very attractive. It holds the promise of ineffable joy, you might say. That is what this tree holds. Then he consciously starts walking towards the tree, although that rope is still available. Now he doesn't run around. He actually starts walking towards the tree. So this is conscious yoga. So now he d doesn't make full use of even the rope that is available, that length which is available, because he realizes that if I run far away, there's tension. On the other hand, the closer I keep moving to the tree, the more joy I feel. So now he starts walking towards the tree, doesn't want to use his free will. He's subordinated his personal will to the divine will, you can say. So then he starts moving in that direction. So that is the transition. And that's how you can see a very important transition. Because once this transition has been made, then the person never goes back to the previous state. That is the assurance the Gita has given us. We'll come to that a little later, although I know I'm going a little beyond, much beyond time. I don't know whether you are finding it as interesting as I am, but uh, anyway. So. so then late the joy ineffable is felt, then he remembers his forgotten self. He has refound the skies from which he fell. At length, his front's indomitable line forces the last passes of the ignorance. Advancing beyond nature's last known bounds, reconnoitering the formidable unknown, beyond the landmarks of things visible, it mounts through a miraculous upper air till climbing the mute summit of the world, he stands upon the splendor peaks of God. Now this is a very brief summary, you can say, of uh, the conscious yoga, that is when the person has realized that I am truly the soul, why my soul is embodied here, what is the purpose of life, and he starts walking consciously. That entire journey, Maybe not in this life, but at least conscious yoga of several lives. Ultimately, he reaches the splendor peaks of God. So let's go over this a little slowly. At length, his front's indomitable line. Indomitable cannot be defeated. Now you know this line cannot be defeated because now it's a, become a more conscious process. So it's not sometimes winning, sometimes losing, sometimes holding a lonely post and sometimes making a, a tactical retreat. No, sometimes... Uh, uh, pain, sometimes pleasure, sometimes hunger, sometimes plenty. All that variation, tr tremendous variation that was there in the previous phase, that is not there. Now there is a clear line, an indomitable line which is being followed, a line along which there is no scope for defeat and failure, forces the last passes of the ignorance. So this ignorance, uh, the last frontiers of ignorance are now being past, the person is crossing those, transcending those last frontiers of ignorance. Advancing beyond nature's last known bounds, reconnoitering the formidable unknown, reconnoitering, you know, uh, gathering information about the enemy. So now he also knows what are the obstacles. Once you know what the obstacles are, as in a battle, once you know your enemy well, then you have a very good chance of def defeating the enemy. So, reconnoitering the formidable unknown, and there are plenty of those obstacles and hostile forces which will still come in the way even when the person is on conscious yoga. But the person knows them, he's reconnoitering them, he's gathering information about them so that he can deal with them better. Reconnoitering the formidable unknown beyond the landmarks of things visible. So, now he's not 
looking at this journey entirely in terms of things which are visible, now he has some dim view also of what is not visible. It mounts through a miraculous upper air. Upper air, that is that rarer atmosphere uh, in which things may not be concrete, palpable, measurable, but all the same, it has started becoming more and more real to him. Till climbing the mute summit of the world, he stands upon the splendor peaks of God. Now he's reached the very summit of this world, which is the same as the splendor peaks of God. That is, those peaks where he can experience the splendor of God, the heights of God. So that is where he has reached. So this is the journey of the soul from life to life. Now towards the end I thought I'll draw a little comparison of this entire thing with the Gita. In the Gita, Sri Krishna gives a certain message and a lesson to Arjun. Because Arjun is also having this sort of a revulsion against death, death of my near and dear ones. Here, Savitri's mother is also having the same sort of a feeling of uh, why should Satyavan die? Why should death be there? Or why should I get into a situation in which uh, death is inevitable? Hmm? At least I can stay away from it. The Virgin said, at least I can stay away from the death of my near and dear ones. Uh, let me not be a part of what will bring about their death, so I will not fight. So Savitri's mother says, let her not marry this person. So there's a similarity. In uh, the Gita, Sri Krishna ends up giving the lesson to Arjuna, using that as sort of the context and bringing out many deeper truths which uh, were not absolutely necessary. Shri Krishna could have just said, no, don't be a coward, fight. Arjuna might have still fought. No? But then he used, you know, what we call these days in education, lateral learning. That is, you don't only solve the problem, you solve the problem in such a way that the student ends up learning a lot on the side. So that is what Shri Krishna did and that is what Narad also did. So Narad giving the lessons of the deeper truths of existence to the queen may be compared to Krishna giving those lessons to Arjun. In both cases, death was what stimulated these lessons. And uh, corresponding to this, therefore you find that in the Gita also, <coughs> in the second chapter, uh, what is pointed out is the idea of rebirth. <clears throat> Not only the immortality of the soul, but also rebirth comes in the second chapter, in verse 27. Jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu, dhruvam janma mrityasya cha, tasmat apariharyarthe natvam shochito marhasi. Jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu. The one who is born is sure to die. Dhruva is fixed. So jatasya jo paida hua hai. Paida hua hai. Paida hone wale ke liye. Kya hai? Dhruva mrityu. Mrityu is dhruva fixed. Dhruvam janma mrityasya cha. Fixed also is the janma of the mrityasya. The one who has died, his janma is also fixed. So both are fixed. Which means that Rebirth is as much of a certainty as death. Jatasya hi dhruvo mrityo, dhruvam janma mrityasya cha. And therefore, Sri Krishna says, tasmat apariharya arthe. Therefore, apariharya. What is inevitable, arthe means for the sake of. For the sake of in the inevitable, natvam shochitum arhasi. Do not grieve, do not feel sad, have no sorrow for that which is inevitable. Death is inevitable and that should not create sorrow because rebirth is also inevitable. Then you know how about uh, the, why does the soul have to come back again and again? What for? 
For that also we have in the Gita, if you go to the sixth chapter, when Arjun asks Sri Krishna that, uh, how about uh, someone who cannot complete the journey of yoga in one lifetime, and most of us can't, that is a fact. Uh, what happens to that person? Either se bhi gaya, udar se bhi gaya. Hmm? Neither reach the peaks of yoga nor enjoy all the other things other, other people in this world are enjoying. Ye to nahi hoga. So then Sri Krishna shows him, no, anyone who walks this path is sure to get something. That effort is never a waste and this will continue from life to life. After reaching a certain stage, the person will come back again, be born either in the family of yogis or in a well-to-do prosperous family and both can have a relevance, we will not get into that. Yogi's family one can understand to get the right atmosphere. But why or a prosperous family where he can continue the journey further? Because a certain amount of material security does create those conditions where you can have the other luxuries of life like say walking the spiritual path consciously. So uh, having a certain degree of material security and comfort can have a value. So anyway, so <clears throat> he told that he'll be born in such a way. But even more important is the fact that he'll be born with certain tendencies. And that is what will make him continue the journey further consciously. Tatratam buddhi samyogam labhate parva devikam yatate cha tato bhūya sam siddhau kurunandana Kurunandana, that is just addressing Arjuna, in the child of the Kurus, that's the name of the ancestors. Tatratam buddhi samyogam, tatra is there, over there. Over there means where the person is reborn. Tatratam buddhi samyogam Labhate Parva Dehikam. So, Parva Dehikam, previous bodies. Because of what he has gained in the previous bodies, what he has achieved in the previous bodies, what will he, Labhate means what will he gain in this life? Buddhism Yogam. That is, he'll gain a certain type of Buddhic disposition. Buddhic disposition, you can say an intelligent disposition, or you can say a disposition like that of the Buddha. Both are quite related. So a buddhic disposition, he'll get. Which means he'll have come with a certain type of tendencies already. Because of parva dehikam, because of the dehe bodies that he has as had earlier. Yatate cha tato bhūya. That is, why here he'll have that? Because he had formed these in the previous lives. Sam siddhav. And he will try to again endeavor for going towards Siddhi, that is perfection. So because of the tendencies uh, which are the result of what he had done in the previous lives, in this life he will come with a certain disposition which will make him make efforts for going towards Siddhi, that is perfection on this path. Tatratam buddhi samyogam labhate parva dehikam yatate cha tato bhūya sam siddhau kuru nandana. So, you can see that uh, there is a great parallel between the message of the Gita and the message of Savitri, particularly as put in the mouth of Narada Vaishya Aurobindo. So, this life in short, is only a small fraction of the entire journey of the soul. We perform for many lives this journey without being conscious of uh, why we are here, which way this journey is going. But after making a certain amount of advance, we start doing it more consciously. That is when the journey becomes more enjoyable. That is when the journey, even to us, acquires a certain direction and a certain goal. It was there all along, but uh, for quite some time, many lives, we may not know it. But then you say, if we didn't know it, how is it that eventually a person does reach that stage where it becomes conscious yoga? Can it happen entirely accidentally? Perhaps not. Perhaps even that is not purely accidental. The divine is making sure of that. And uh, one way one can look at it is like this. Let's suppose uh, there's a child you're playing with the parent. Hmm? 
the parent knows the game well enough to sort of win all the time. But then uh, parent make sure that the child will also keep winning sometime. In fact, many times. And so the parent keeps making those concessions. The parent keeps making those deliberate mistakes himself to make sure that the child keeps winning. Otherwise, the child will get too disappointed and dejected. He will not like to play the game at all. So that sort of arrangement is perhaps being made without our knowing it, even in those lives when we are not consciously on the path. And that is why we are able to reach, after a certain number of lives, the stage where we can be more conscious of where life should be going. So conscious yoga is uh, the result of that. Or if I, uh, uh, mistaken in the, sure, Savitri, again, there is a very beautiful expression. The unseeing hands following the unseen hand or something to that effect. So the hands which are working, they are unseeing, but they are being guided by the unseen hand, the hand which we cannot see. So that unseen hand makes sure that these unseeing hands in the process of, during the phase of unconscious yoga, also keep making some advances, not, not leaving it purely to the accident. But then what after reaching the splendor peaks of God? The person went through this lives of unconscious yoga, went through this conscious yoga, finally he, in some life he has also reached the splendor peaks of God, as Sri Aurobindo calls them in this. What after that? After that, it doesn't mean that the person does not come back again. At least Sri Aurobindo is quite emphatic about this. That even after that, escaping the cycle of life and death is not necessarily the aim. The person can come back to guide others, the way a person after getting the PhD may go and teach in a school or college. So in the same way, even after reaching the splendor peaks of God, the person can keep coming back again and again to this world for the sake of others and also for the sake of enjoying this world through total knowledge. Living in this knowledge world in a state of ignorance is what is responsible for all the misery and suffering in this world. But if the person has total knowledge, can see the whole truth, then the difficulties of this world, all the things evil in this world, everything that the person wrong, finds wrong in this world, will not affect this person, this person can still see it like a spectator, like a witness from a distance and just enjoy the drama the way you, go, you may go and enjoy a drama or a film. Although there may be a lot that may be wrong, a lot that is unpleasant in this, but you know that this is not real, so you can look at it from a distance. You know that this is only a game or only a play, so you can look at it from a distance and enjoy it. So this person can help others inspire others and at the same time enjoy this world in spite of the way the world is, this person will not be affected. So seeing it from a higher plane, seeing it with the vision of the total truth, the person can enjoy life even in this miserable world. That is what, why he can keep coming back again and again because now life is no longer misery for him, he can enjoy it and same time inspire others so that more and more of humanity is on that path. And that is the vision of Sri and the Mother, that more of, more of humanity should be moving in that direction so that the typical human nature itself changes and that will ch what will change the character of the world. The world will no longer remain a place of misery and suffering as it has been for thousands of years. It can become one with heaven. <laughs>